Okay, we're ready to start. We were missing some of you yesterday for, uh, I know, the career fair, I'm sure. So then uh, I need a little report from the career fair. Uh, anything that stood out? Anything surprising? Anything disappointing? I need a couple of comments just to get started here. Nobody? It was just... <laughs> it was all right. You got an interview out of it? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, what were the propensity of positions available? I mean, sometimes, I haven't been there for years, but I thought, one time I went there and I thought, oh, there's a lot of spots in X, and I can't remember what it was, soil or forestry or whatever. And, Anybody? Any comments? Nothing? Anybody ask any hard questions? Like uh, one time I told my class one year, I go, when you go over there, ask some of the companies, why were the last five people let go? Anybody ever ask that? And you know what was surprising? They came back and told me what the people said, and you know what they said? And it was like you couldn't orchestrate this, right? Because it was all independent. Dishonesty. That was why most of the last five people left. They were like writing things in their report, like I checked this quality, whatever. They never did. Just honestly, it was, this was like five years ago. Because, you know, I said, blame it on me. Say, Rod wants to know why were the last five people let go. You know, something like that. I'm not looking for a job. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one. Uh, let's see, we don't have a dog today, but. Uh, I have a dog coming in the afternoon class, but this reminds me tomorrow we have a dog coming, don't we? Is it somebody here? Rachel, right? Yeah. And you're, what's the breed again? Uh, she's a Shih Tzu. Shih Tzu, yes. Have you ever seen that vet clinic? Uh, you will love our services, we shit you not. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it, I've got a picture of that, it's pretty good. But yeah, that's fun. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, that's good. Okay, is this a question about stuff? About class. About it's class, okay. Not necessarily about the class. Okay, good, yeah, so it's logistics or whatever. Let's go, talk, bring um, it on. Do we have an exam next week? Yes, we have an assessment next week, just like we always do. It's a uh, fall break, so you won't see us here Monday or Tuesday, but Wednesday we'll be here, like today is Wednesday, right? Yeah, so just like today, we go to math for assessment. Yep, and if you look at that grid work of weekly things, it's muscles and bone, basically, and the assessment will be there, yep. Got to keep rolling on. Good question, anything else? Here we go. Um, the ovarian cyst. Is that, is that entire thing the cyst? Yes, okay, you must have clicked on the answer, yes. When you're, see he's smiling too, do you notice that? Because there's like bragging rights, what, you know, among uh, OBGYNs, like, okay, what's the biggest cyst you remove? And if it's like 10 pounds, well then if you did 11, you're the winner. So yeah, very common, well no, I shouldn't say common, but yeah, it's they grow over many, weeks and months and the person thinks it's just weight gain a lot of times but yeah if you punctured that most that would be there's a lot of liquid in there unless it was a tumor so I, i'm assuming it's basically full of liquid but uh, yeah he's very proud of it i don't know if he's the guy who took it out or he got it handed to him but ovarian cysts and an interesting thing when we do reproduction you can ask me about it i actually can make ovarian cysts in cattle very interesting in fact, I probably have one in my office, but maybe it's in the cabinet, yeah. So yeah, uh, it's a weird thing, but yeah, very terrible because the whole ovary, has, that has to be removed. So you don't know, maybe the contralateral ovary is still okay, right? Because a lot of times it's only unilateral, but good question. Oh yeah, they get really, really big, it can be. Okay, other questions? This is good, okay. So today I've got, I got, you know, I always have this list to start out with. 
on my thing. And um, oh, before I forget, Riley that brought Creed. Are you here? Riley, are you here? I'm going to try to remember. I didn't give Creed one of those bowl pizzles, so I'm going to bring a bowl pizzle tomorrow for the Shih Tzu, and then I'll bring one for uh, Riley. Anyway, yesterday. Yesterday was good because do you notice how we had a lot of questions about fundamental neurology, how the axons talk to a dendrite and all that, and that's perfect because that's why we do face-to-face. -face. I know the videos are great, I'm being facetious, but um, you know the face-to-face -face is really important. And earlier this morning I heard the videos don't help me at all over here. And it was interesting, so if you're ever in a place where the videos don't help you at all, Make sure the feedback gets back to the people that are doing the videos because, you know, maybe they think they're great. I don't know. You know what I mean? But uh, this thing about, could you tell me what class that is? Chemistry 116. Is that the one where you don't have class at all? It's a hybrid. I hybrid, yeah. Whatever. Yeah, we have a two hour Yeah, yeah. Okay. These things are all kind of experimental hybrid. But okay, remember now what we say here in this room never leaves the room? You know that? It's hard to find a chemistry person to teach those classes because you have a whole room of people that don't want chemistry. What if I came in here and I knew nobody was interested in physiology? That's what they come into. They come into a room that nobody wants to learn chemistry. So they basically try to avoid it. Sometimes, have they do, ever do the switch the instructor halfway through? Yes. yes. Because they can't find anybody that would sit there the whole time. So they make this bargain. They go, okay, we need somebody to teach those non-chemistry people. Would you do it halfway? Because here's what happened one time. They had the instructor switch. This is a couple years ago, but one of my students was telling me this. Then the second instructor came in and started giving chemistry, right? But it ended up being the last two weeks of the first instructor. It was complete overlap. Like, let's say, Chapter eight and nine was the last one, and now eight and nine here, they didn't even communicate. And I said, did anybody say anything? No. <laughs> so for two weeks, it was a complete overlap of the last two weeks. So that, that hurts me, because what, you wasted two weeks, and you know, you're here, life is short, you have a career. But if I had to come in here and I knew nobody wanted to learn physiology, I would have a different state of mind, I really would. So I, but I know a lot of people are interested, so this, it, it gives me, it feeds me. So, so then they try the videos and then they don't have to go to class. And if you've ever had one of those classes, at the beginning there's people sitting in the aisle way, and at the end of the semester you could shoot a gun this way and not hit anybody, right? <laughs> have you seen that? It's like, what? Because I, I sat into 115, 116 about 10 years ago thinking, okay, whatever they say in there, I'm going to try to bring in my class and make chemistry more friendly. But it was stunning, the beginning of that. At the end, it was like, what did I say? Everybody left, you know. Anyway. So we're going to do vocab words today. And yesterday, the one we introduced was refractory. And so I want to talk about refractory a little bit more and expand it beyond neurology because we did talk about it when we did endocrinology. So now let's see what these guys say. Refractory, stubborn, unmanageable. That's kind of like the TAs over there. <laughs> unmanageable. Resistant to a process or stimulus. That's kind of like yesterday, right? We said something, if you had an inhibitory neurotransmitter like GABA, it moves the resting potential more negative. And it would be resistant to a stimulus. The normal stimulus wouldn't work. So refractory is that, you know, it's sometimes unresponsive. It's not too bad, it, you know. So here's the kicker. Yesterday we talked about how if the, uh, Resting potential went lower than, if the membrane potential, I should say, went lower than resting, then the tissue could be called refractory, okay? So then in endocrinology, sometimes you give, like, let's say I give an exogenous uh, HCG. Remember that human chorionic gonadotropin? Did you write down that it's LH-like? I think you might have done that. So if I wanted to cause an ovulation in an animal, and if I inject <coughs> human chorionic gonadotropin, remember that was harvested from the urine of gravid women. 
and the cow didn't respond to me, I could say the cow was refractory, had a refractory state for some reason, because normally that would maybe cause ovulation, okay? So then in endocrinology, why would a tissue be refractory? Well, maybe it doesn't have receptors that it normally would, right? So no receptors for the hormone? Or the cell is unable to make the product that it should. Maybe it has receptors, but internally it doesn't have the precursors to make another hormone that might respond, okay? And uh, that's what I wanted to connect it with last week's lesson because, and it was on, on one of the test questions, so the TAs can help me here, you guys in the audience too. There was a question about something about the answer was malnutrition. What was it? Something about um, reason for diseases in undeveloped countries. What was the main reason? And I got that out of the reading. Uh, because, so malnutrition, if you don't have the amino acids that it takes to make antibodies, then you vaccinate an animal or a person, they won't respond because they, you know, they don't have the amino acids to build the Y-shaped antibodies. So in one sense, they're refractory to immunization, okay? So refractory is a general term, it's, you know, you can say the tissue is refractory, so I know, I can't remember, you know, sometimes we always thought postpartum cows, that's cows that have given birth and then reproduction doesn't start for a while. We, we, I can't remember what we were talking about one time, we called those cows refractory. They weren't going to respond to a normal, um, hormone injection. Okay, so that's one key word. Then I want to bring a new, uh, another one up, and Grace is going to help me remind me about this. Now, Grace, you did the bursa of Fabricius, and then after class, do you, do you go to another class right now? Okay, well, maybe if we, some, you talk to me tomorrow, will you? I got a little proposition for you about bird physiology. But tell me what, what happened that the graduate students did wrong or something. Refresh my memory. Oh, so the doctor took out the bursa and gum chips during development, and the graduate <coughs> student unintentionally selected the chicks that had been bursectomized, and then they did not respond to the vaccine. To the vaccine. So they were looking for B cell formation and uh, antibody production. So then look at this. By accident, the graduate students injected a vaccine into the bursectomized chicks and they didn't get a response but then they they didn't like discard and go well I must have done something wrong they really does discovered the bursa then right because like you said why didn't these animals respond does anybody know what term that brings up when you discover something you weren't intending to serendipity I guess it's on the screen already this is serendipity I didn't quite do that timing right Serendipity, and let's see this, the occurrence or development of events by chance in a happy or beneficial way. So Grace told us about the discovery of the bursa. Nobody said we're going to try to discover the purpose of this, uh, but it's by accident. <clears throat> so by serendipity, you're going to discover something that you weren't really searching for, uh, an attitude, aptitude for making this Desirable discovery by accident. Okay, so it's something about a pleasant surprise. You weren't planning this. Sometimes in science this happens. Do you know penicillin was discovered this way? Serendipity. Okay, so I wanted to bring that word up because maybe, well, some of you will be scientists, and if you're out there and something happens and like you can't quite explain it, maybe think a little harder about it rather than discard it as, you know, some fluke or something. Because, you know, if they, if the graduate, if the professor and the graduate students wouldn't have said, why didn't that work? They might have just said, well, you must have injected the vaccine wrong. Let's get another group of animals or something. But they were astute enough to say, well, wait a minute, those chicks you used by accident didn't have a bursa. And now, now we know that's the B cell, you know, making the B cell. So very, very interesting. Okay, so now <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about atrophy, which is I know it's in some of those good videos or whatever, but it's such a common thing 
and then I might even draw how it how it works. But it's used a lot. So atropine, let me enlarge this a little bit for those of you. Let's see. Okay. It almost doesn't matter which one I use, but okay. So now this brings up a point. Okay. A lot of times when you use like some compound like if you ever use heparin, sometimes it's called sodium heparin. Uh, this one says atropine sulfate. Sometimes when you isolate these chemicals, there's always some other uh, molecules along with it. But th anyway, this is injectable, and this happens to be talking about human stuff. But um, let's see, I mean, we don't care about the structure. But I want to talk about how it's used in small animal surgery, especially. Okay, so. If you know when you're having like a dog or cat on surgery, one of the things that happens is that usually the anesthetic agent causes a lowered heart rate, okay? It's just kind of a depressing thing. Well, anyway, atropine actually counteracts that effect and causes a slight increase in heart rate, okay? So that's one effect of it, increased heart rate. If you've ever seen a uh, dog or cat under surgery, there's that tube that goes in the trachea. That's called the endotracheal tube. You, I used to do a lot of sheep surgery, and I actually have a cut on my hand when I was putting the endotracheal tube upside down in the sheep. It wasn't quite uh, under from the injection, and she clamped down on my finger, and I've got a nice little scar because the molars are very sharp. Anyway. Atropine also decreases salivation. And so when you have an animal intubated, the less moisture there that could get down into the lungs, the better. Okay, so it's got increased heart rate, decrease <coughs> salivation. It decreases gut motility. And if you're doing anything in the abdominal cavity, that's a plus. Because those, are, did I tell you about the four by four gauze, right? In here, the sheet, did I tell you that story tonight? Here, because you know, I've got three classes, so we all kinds of stories. If you ever do abdominal surgery, and this was like sheep, we're gonna end up doing funky things in the ovary, cauterize, and then over later. I didn't tell you that. Phrase. Okay, anyway, the intestines are always moving, and that's a plus side, because that's what they should be. If, they, if you ever go into an animal and the intestines aren't moving, that's not good. Anyway, but if you give an animal um, atropine, it tends to decrease gut motility, and that makes it easier to move around in the abdominal cavity. Let's say you're doing an overectomy. Well, one time we were doing this sheep experiment where we electrocauterized the follicles on a U and heat. So we'd go mid ventral labyrinth and bring up the ovaries, and with an electrocautery, like this, and I probably can show you what that looks like up on the screen. Anyway, we destroy preoperatory follicles. Then we put the ovaries back in, sewed her up with what's called non-absorbable suture, because three days later we went back in that same spot. And then we were going to overectomize them and then take the ovaries and do some analysis. But the second time we got into the one sheep, we discovered we had left one of those four by four gauzes, you know, they call them sponge, and they've got that little square, you know, most of you have seen that. The squares, little squares, maybe two millimeters square. The intestine had wrapped around the four by four gauze and it was trying to digest it from the outside. It was stunning, what, you know, it's like, so it had wrapped around this four by four gauze, you know how thin they are, but they're four inches by four inches. So I literally pulled off the gauze off the outside of the intestine. And when I had the gauze over here, the intestine had the little patterns of squares on it. That's how hard it was trying to digest it. And if you ever read about human surgery, a lot of times something's left inside. Have you ever heard that? Like somebody's got a pain and then two years later they find a, uh, a scissor or something. And so it's, you know, we never, you know, we didn't intend to leave it, but it was surprising. It was like, I'll never forget that. I wish that we had a camera at the time. I pulled that off and the intestine had the little square pattern. Okay, so atropine decreases gut motility. Now for surgery, it doesn't really matter, but it dilates the pupils as well. Okay, 
And then here's another thing that it does. It is an antidote. Now, so this kind of begs the question about having a page that says atropine, right? It's an uh, antidote for insecticide poisoning. Okay? And so it is relatively cheap. It can be administered any way you want. If you can find a vein, great. If you can't, you can do it intermuscular. It's just like, so in a case of poison, if you have, and this happens like say a bunch of cattle have gotten in, well, it's by mistake, but have gotten into a bag of insecticide, everybody out there needs atropine. And a lot of times you won't be able to find IV, so they'll do it uh, IF or whatever. But it's got a lot of attributes that are very positive for surgery, for interact, uh, counteracting insecticide poisons, because most of the insecticide poisons affect the nervous system of mammals. It's some kind of weird thing where the insecticide, I guess what I should do is maybe show you that. So let me, let me show you the insecticide. <coughs> so atropine, <coughs> what I'll do is I'll say antidote. Let's see what I come up here with. <coughs> and I may not come up with anything. But. So let's see. Okay. <coughs> so now this isn't telling me what it's an antidote for, but it, so they're talking about. Okay, so they're not even mentioning the attributes. Sorry about that. Let's see. Antidotes. Okay, insecticide. So let me do insecticide. And of course, insecticides are a great word because side at the end, C I D E, means killing. So insecticides kill insects. <coughs> okay, and this one's good. Okay. So now, <coughs> so now this this person doesn't agree with exactly my definition of antidote, but that's okay. So these insecticides, you might say, equal organophosphates. So if we were in chemistry class, the chemistry professor could tell us exactly what an organophosphate is. I'm not a big chemistry person. I do know, though, that the insecticides tend to be organophosphates, and they're very poisonous to mammals. And then, look at that nerve agent. Nerve agents were discovered after these insecticides were made. Somebody discovered, and I think it was like in Germany before World War II, they were working on insecticide, and then they realized that it would poison people, so it's called a nerve agent poisoning. And the most famous one is sarin, capital S-A-R-I-N. So sarin was discovered in Germany it was being made for an insecticide, but now it's the most famous nerve agent that, let's say, terrorists want to get a hold of. And now this person says atropine is not an actual antidote because that person is saying, well, it doesn't exactly counteract exactly the organophosphate uh, itself, and that's true, but it blocks the action of acetylcholine. Okay, so there's that famous neurotransmitter. And so what happens is in poisoning, the poison kills acetylcholine esterase. You remember that little diagram? We might get that out. <coughs> so if you kill the, uh, and this is a functional, this is very important for nerve function. I'm going to go back and set my camera before I forget, don't miss anything here. The other day we talked about how a neurotransmitter has to be chewed up or pumped away from the postsynaptic membrane right away. Remember that? That's how nerves function. The neurotransmitter works and then it's pumped away. If you kill the acetylcholine esterase, then acetylcholine sits there too long. And the atropine comes in and binds into the same receptor as acetylcholine. So maybe that I'll, I'll draw that out for you. <coughs> anyway, so this person says it's not an actual antidote because it, maybe he, that person is saying, 
that antidote would have to work exactly against the phosphate, right? In my world, my little world, atropine is an antidote for organophosphate poisoning because it's it's maybe not counteracting directly the organophosphate, but it's counteracting the effect of it. So let me do the document cam and I'll draw that out because this is another function of you know nerves. So I'm going to do an axon talking to a dendrite. I'm going to make it big. <coughs> And I'll make sure I'm on the screen now. I am. Um, so on top is the axon. <coughs> and you know everything flows this way. And on the bottom it's a dendrite. Okay? Oh yeah, and that's, that reminds me, I gotta show you how nerves can live after they've been cut. Remind me about that, okay, Sarah? If I get that. It's kind of amazing. Anyway. You know there's neurotransmitters that are in vesicles up here, right? And then once the action potential gets down to the axon, these things get released into the cleft. And then they're gonna to bind to a receptor. Almost kind of like the hormones, right? Re there were receptors, specific receptors. And then I'm gonna say the acetylcholine esterase is an enzyme, and I'm just gonna put it E, and we've had this before, but there's an enzyme right here that chews it up right away. So I'm not gonna draw that, but when um, acetylcholine, now let's say this is a salivary gland too, okay? You might wanna write down salivary gland, for example. Acetylcholine, diffuses across the cleft. It's not being pumped across, it's diffusion. Binds to receptor. This causes this, maybe the salivary gland to release saliva. But then almost immediately, the enzyme, acetylcholine esterase, chews this molecule up, right? Well, what happens is during, now, okay, now I'm, step two is insecticide poisoning. Insecticide poisoning kills the enzyme. So, here it is. Okay, now this is step two. This is unusual. So, in insecticide poisoning, what happens to salivation? Now, in my drawing there, if you don't take the acetylcholine away, excess salivation. So these cows, <coughs> after poisoning, would all be salivating profusely because of this. Now you haven't arrived with the antidote yet, right? There's no antidote given yet. So the normal, then this is abnormal, insecticide poisoning kills the en enzyme. But notice it doesn't sit in the receptor. Notice how the receptor is still open? But the receptor would have, a lot of them would have the acetylcholine sitting in here, right? This would be here. So it's overstimulating this postsynaptic membrane. And in this case, it would be excess salivation. Now you inject atropine. Atropine gets distributed through the body, and it's an A, and it has this propensity to sit in the receptor. Now what does salivation do? Decrease. Okay, because now the normal acetylcholine doesn't get the sit into the receptor and stimulate this membrane. Okay, and so, so in insecticide poisoning, it goes all over and kills acetylcholine esterase. So there's other bad things it does, but anti the atropine is the antidote because it sits in the receptor because then that keeps away the normal acetylcholine, okay? Now, everything has a half-life, right? <clears throat> right off the top of my head, I cannot tell you the half-life of atropine, <laughs> but because Google, let's see how good it is. Oh, sorry, gotta go back here. 
So what I did is I plugged in half-life of atropine. Running, there we go. Um, or G, okay, so it's significant levels are achieved within 30 minutes to one hour and disappear rapidly with a half-life of two hours. Okay, so atropine lasts two hours. So you know how it is, two, half of it's gone, then another two hours, a half of that amount, right? Two, 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 two right? So the thing is, usually with insecticide poison, you need more atropine given later. You give it, the animals hopefully live, but then if the effects start returning again, then you give some more atropine. Now if the half-life would be two days, you would never have to give another dose, right? It's gonna last a long time. But only two hours, half of it's gone in two hours, yeah. Um, on the quizzes for this week, it says about three hours, so which would you prefer us to reference? Wow, so the quiz says three, so here's the deal, it's two or three. Because you know how this works out. When somebody does an investigation, maybe the book I was looking at at the time I made the video, book said three hours, but they usually never tell you what animal it was done in. And sometimes half-lives can vary by who you inject it into. But so I would say if one, if I said three in the video and this says two, that's darn close, isn't it? Really, when you think about it, how it so not bad, yeah. Okay, so then what were you gonna remind me? Um, about the hunger. Oh, the nerve, yeah, yeah. yeah. After right. Okay, <clears throat> because now when I was your age, just a little younger maybe in high school, the Vietnam War was going on. I had a draft card. I watched on TV one night if I was gonna be drafted tomorrow. Pretty traumatic. 58,000 of my fellow young people died. Every week it was like hundreds of people died. Some of the veterans came back without legs. But you know, their big toe still itched. How does a missing toe, a missing leg, have an itchy toe that doesn't exist? That's what I want to show you now. And it's called phantom pain. <clears throat> and we'll come down a little bit. Phantom pain, did I spell phantom right? Because you guys are better English. See, when I took high school English, we had a book that said words are important. Being the radical I was, I made R into art. <laughs> That's the radical I was. I'm, I'm better now. Okay, here's the deal. If a nerve gets cut, like an amputation, <clears throat> but the cell body is still in living tissue, the nerve still functions. Okay, so if you cut a leg, okay, yeah. So remember, don't laugh at me when I draw. This is a leg with a foot. Okay, oops, sorry, there's the foot. <laughs> and there's a nerve in there. Here's the nerve cell body. Here's some dendrites. Here's a long axon. And maybe goes to a sensory receptor. Now we amputate. Pretty good, Sarah. Anyway. <coughs> so now you amputate. What? Your on that yeah, article. you can. I'll give it to you after class. Thanks. <laughs> Notice the cell body is still in the living part of the body. Do you know what happens right here where it's cut off? That uh, axon seals itself. And so it's going to be viable from here up. Well, it's the same thing, just the same thing. So, yeah. is the cell body pretty close to like... Well, you know, there's gonna be more than cell bodies and it, you'd have to draw with the exact anatomy, but yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like this. But remember now, here's the other thing. 
Um, up here, this is going to go to the brain, right? There's a, a trap going to the brain, right? <clears throat> That's the kicker. So here it is. If you ever lose a limb or any part, the brain does not know it. Those connections are still going up. And what's kind of neat is, let's say this is this little square is like the switchboard in the brain. And it's got different lights. This is my analogy. So now I'm in the brain. Those little lights are connected to different nerves, right? If this light lights up, the brain knows that's connected to the left toe and it must be itchy, okay? But even if the leg's gone, if that light lights up, it's perceived as an itchy toe. Are you following me now? Okay, because that's called the labeled line theory in the brain. Labeled line theory. I think it's in the video, I can't remember anyway. If that's your own deep deck guy. So the brain is just connected to all these wires. If it lights up, it says, itchy toe, left, itchy toe. That light over there goes up, my back is itchy, okay? Or pain from someplace. So now you've got this leg, the stump, and if you have pressure, that somehow presses against that nerve and it starts an action potential, that's how it works. That's how phantom pain works. The nerve is being, has pressure or something is causing an action potential and then it propagates up because that was a normal pathway, wasn't it? If this is a sensory nerve, the normal pathway was always this way. We're not causing it to do something else. Yeah? Is it possible for us to have that The question was, is it possible to, for a surgeon to go cut that nerve? Let's say it's really bothering somebody, right? Yes, but nerves, you would, uh, I should show you, maybe tomorrow I can show you some tissue. It's hard to identify nerves. They're like little pieces of floss. Whenever you dissect them, dissect tissue, the hardest thing to find is the nerve, unless they're really big. It's like they're very tiny. Okay, so do you see how phantom pain can be? The track is still there. I got one last word I gotta tell you before, so don't pack up yet. So that's phantom pain. Then there's another thing called referred pain. Referred pain. And that's where we'll start tomorrow in math. Referred pain, re reminding. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Good questions.